working on. Uh, okay, we'll get there. Rebecca, uh, good morning. Yeah. I'm very excited to. Uh, good to, afternoon. Or good <laughs> afternoon. I was up late. It's uh. Sorry, all right, hang on too. one second, everyone. I, I'm already off on a bad foot this this afternoon. There we go. Okay, oh, nice. so everyone. Uh, I like we're matching yeah. too. We didn't even coordinate that. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, well, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, so I have Rebecca uh, Panico from Hilton. And uh, as you guys can imagine, uh, given what's going on in our lives and the world over the last 12 to 14 months, uh, she's got a lot of information and really just uh, sharing a lot of the experiences that they've gone through in the travel industry. And so with that, uh, I'm really happy to welcome her. Rebecca, if you don't mind, uh, let me just turn it over to you for just a minute or two. Give a quick intro, uh, you know, as well as your responsibility today at Hilton, and then I'll jump in with some questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here, and thank you for inviting me to speak about our experiences overall, and just a little bit about me. Um, so, I am the senior director of the global media strategy and planning at Hilton. It's a really long title. Um, and basically what that means is that I, um, I lead our, our, our media strategy, um, specifically really thinking through how we build our brand and, um, you know, build the portfolio for Hilton. So I've been at Hilton for almost two years now. I started uh, June of 2019, um, so right before the pandemic hit. We can get into that, I think, a little bit more later. Um, and prior to that, I've, I've been in the industry, in the media industry, for over 20 years. Um, and I worked a number of years at starting my career on the agency side, and then moved over to the brand side um, at Capital One um, about five or six years ago, and then moved to Hilton about two years ago. So um, I've been around in the media industry and seen a lot of change. Um, and it's excited to have this chat with you today, Sean. Yeah, same here. Well, you already outed yourself because as I was doing research, and my mm -hmm. first question was going to be from uh, reading your background and experience. It appears you started in uh, you started your career around the age of ten, uh, back in 1998 <laughs> with uh, Sachi and Sachi, and then you proceeded <laughs> to do some tours of duty at MPG, Havas, uh, Hill Holiday, before moving to the brand side uh, with Capital One and now Hilton. I'm just I'd love mm -hmm. to just. I love just stories on kind of careers and lives. And let's begin with just yeah. what was that transition like? Had, did you always want to get on the brand side? Was it a tough decision? And, yeah. uh, you know, how did, how did that happen? And, and what's been the experience? Yeah, definitely. Well, it's really funny. I mean, if I even take a step back from that, I, you know, I didn't even, marketing wasn't even on my radar growing up or thinking through as a career. I want to be a professional musician. <laughs> and then as I was, um, you know, going to school and, and, and everything. What I really realized is that I, I love people and I love thinking about, you know, how to connect with people. People watching is one of my favorite things to do in life. And so I learned that through kind of that passion and love of just kind of understanding people and dynamics of human behavior, that marketing was a, an area of focus that probably would resonate for me from a career perspective. And so from that standpoint, that's how I kind of got into the marketing profession and then media being kind of the center point of creating and connection connections between brands and people it really became this you know this area of focus for me overall and that's how I got into this industry um, and what I love about it is that it's just constantly evolving and changing um, and so you know I yeah, I, I think that's I really, what most people hate about it though isn't that what most people hate about the industry that it just it just never seems to stand still uh, yeah, I guess so. But for me, I mean, it feels like um, the evolution is just really interesting and cool. And it keeps me on my toes and makes me, you know, have to think a little harder. And that keeps life interesting, right? Of like the evolution, because if we kind of stood in the same place, it wouldn't be a very interesting life to live, in my opinion, right? So that's what I love about it. It's why I stayed in the industry. And it's why I, I always self, I, I never understood that. I'm like, look, the only constant in life is change. I mean, we have to learn to right. embrace it. And my phrase is, let's, you know, I want everybody to get comfortably uncomfortable. If we're not yeah. always changing, we're not learning, we're not growing. Um, yeah. But that's great. Yeah. So then, yeah, keep going. And then into the uh, brand side of it. 
Yeah, no, totally. And so then um, I moved into the agency life. Um, and I think I've just, I've had the benefit um, through my agency experience, starting off of kind of test driving different industries, right? I've had the pleasure of working with a number of, you know, huge brands and key marquee names out there. And I think it allowed me to really test drive what the different industries were in the start of my career and just digging into their businesses and digging into how to create media solutions for those businesses because they're all very different from one another. And, and I think it just grew my arc of knowledge overall so that I kind of created this bank of, of insights that I could draw upon. And then, you know, I did always at, at you know, a point in my career, I think every agency person kind of has this moment of like, okay, what's next? Do I stick it out in the agency world? Do I go brand side? Do I go sales side? Like you kind of have that moment, that, that midlife moment, right? Um, and I always um, felt that going brand side was the direction for me, um, mostly to be able to, I think, linger a little longer in a specific industry and dive more deeply into that versus the agencies that are kind of are ping ponging. So while I appreciated the opportunity to test drive, I think leaning in on the brand side has really been awesome. I draw upon that agency experience a lot in, in the industries that I've worked in on the brand side. Um, because frankly, you know, there's a lot of things that I learned in like getting my stripes agency side that I draw upon today for, for Hilton and even when I was at Capital One. But I do like right now that I can, you know, you get more access to information. Um, there's just more data to work with and, and you, you're having, I feel like a front, you know, front row seat at the table and in, in influence and in making decisions for your, your particular brand. So I, yeah. I really enjoyed the transition quite a bit. Uh, by the way, interesting. I was with you. I was a music. I wanted to be. I wanted to go to music and theater, and my parents wouldn't let me. Uh, oh really? And so I'm like, I said. So I chose advertising. I said, you know, this is, you know, as close as I'm going to get to theater and and creativity yeah. uh, in my life. I mean, so. it's creative. I know my parents yeah. were actually really mad at me when I chose to leave the music space because they invested a lot of money in my <laughs> training. Like, <laughs> I don't think they thought I was any good because they're like, you're going to have to pay your bills at some point. You know, it turned out okay. I'm not complaining. Yeah, clearly, I think you're doing all right. <laughs> yeah. So let's go. Let's talk about your, um, I love this discussion on, you know, individuals and executives who've worked their way you know, really through the agency and really serving uh, the clients on the other end. And you've worked with McDonald's, you've worked with P&G, um, <clears throat> trying to think of some of the other big ones, but I mean, it's marquee brand names, as you said, uh, Marshall's is I think another one. So um, talk first about what it was like when you were at the agency, how did you think about my brand clients? Okay. And now <laughs> that you are the client, what yeah. knowledge or advice can you, I mean, do you see it do you see the it differently from this point of view? Do you have more empathy for the agencies? Um, just talk a little bit about your your yeah. viewpoint and just any advice you'd have uh, for folks yeah. uh, and brands working with their agency. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I I have it's funny because I have more I have more empathy. I have a lot of empathy for my agency partners, and I actually have a lot of empathy for my former former clients. You know, so when. I was on the agency side, you know, I did always, there were times where I felt like, oh, my, my brand clients are, you know, they don't understand how long these things take. They don't understand the complexity of the, the things that they're asking for. They're telling me that I need to deliver more innovation in the media and thought leadership, but, they're, but there's not a lot of time and space for us to ideate as an agency to come up with those solutions. And it frustrated me that my, I felt like my brand's um, clients didn't understand that right. aspect of mm -hmm. it. Um, and I always felt that those clients that I worked with that treated our relationship more like a partnership um, versus this kind of client vendor push and pull, there was always much better work that could come out of that type of overall relationship. And so I think drawing upon that as I moved to the client side, I really um, felt that I wanted to be a better client, you know, I'm, I'm going to be that better client. And frankly, I hope I am. I hope my agencies feel that I'm a better client as a result of knowing that frustration. Um, but I do find that, you know, at times 
I, I get it now as a client, as someone who's in these brand discussions, the, the um, complexity of influence that's required with our executive leadership, you know, and how quick the pace at times is moving and those, those need to, to kind of get the quick turn. So I get the, I get why my clients were sometimes the way they were. Um, and I appreciate that now. So I think just in terms of advice, you know, for me, what I try to do is over communicate as best as I can. Um, and, and I find that that context is king and giving the a rationale and explanation for what we're trying to solution for and invite my agency to be uh, a part of the solution discussions and not just um, servicing what I need. It's really more about a collaboration. Um, so I try to do that as much as possible and um, ask my agencies to, you know, tell me when I'm not or asking, you know, giving them permission to ask more questions and be more curious about what we're trying to accomplish so that we feel like we're in it together as a collaborative relationship. Um, I don't really like the idea of being a client who's just like, you're my vendor, but that's not the way I like to run things from my perspective. And in, in, inside of that, and, you know, I started a few years ahead of you, but you coming at the, really the dawn of the internet and digital, mm -hmm. you've seen this industry from every perspective, you've seen every innovation uh, and thematic movement that we've had. Yeah. Um, you know, if you go back to 2000 and you would read the trades, they'd say, look, you know, it costs us 20 times, agencies say it costs us 20 times to place a dollar of digital than it does a dollar of television. Um, just because of the work. And, and that was in 2000 and the complexity has just continued to expand and expand. And it's always, it's as we continue to add new things, nothing ever drops. We're still buying print, mm -hmm. right? We still have, we're somehow still printing yellow pages. <clears throat> so inside of this, as you think about this increase and in explosion in complexity the last 20 years, and it's not like the brands are paying their agencies more. In fact, we actually, you know, are seeing brands trying to pay their agencies less you know, mm -hmm. as the work increases. And do you believe brands actually see that uh, at the agency side? Or is that something that's just not known? Is there anything? Because I get it on both ends. The brand's like, look, we got to move. This is happening. We need strategy. On the flip side, agencies are like, guys, like we are just like, there are so many platforms we've got to be dealing with right now. Just your thoughts on, on how to create that better connection and understanding. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a and it's a hard one to answer because I think cost constraints are a real thing on the on the brand side, right? You know, we're trying to ourselves do more with little, especially now, and are asking our agencies to do more than with more with less. <laughs> and it, you know, it's it's difficult. Um, you know, I I have been yeah seen a lot of evolution. The thing is though. I would say that the acceleration of digital and technology, bar none, has really revolutionized and just, you know, taken this, this whole complexity to a different level. But it's not a new, a new concept, right? There's always innovation in the media landscape, and there has been for, you know, centuries, right, or a century. And I think it's, it's how well we can, um, I think, pivot with the evolution. Um, I think that that appreciation for the complexity and as a brand recognizing how complex that is and figuring out how we, again, going back to partnership, how can we partner together to create more, um, less goo in the system to um, figure out how to, you know, reach our audiences effectively, efficiently in a highly fragmented, highly distracted, highly automated way. Um, and it's hard. I don't have a silver bullet answer. I think it's just trying to ensure that one, we want to make sure our agencies are paid well to do the work we need them to do, but we also need to um, and, and expect, right, that there's more efficiency that we can put into the system so that we can maniacally manage our costs. And so I think it's trying to find that balance of of achieving what we need to do, but doing it in a way that allows for less goo. And that's the best way to say it, you know? Yeah, and I, get stuck I in mud, agree. But. And I think that that, you know, I do feel that we're still trying to find that place of equilibrium. You know, what's the brand mm -hmm. responsibility, agency responsibility? What's the right 
cost structure, pay structure uh, to achieve mm-hmm. what we need. And I want to get to kind of the deeper stuff here, but I want to ask one last more of a industry question, then we're going to move on to Hilton. Um, yeah. And I'll say that if I gave you a magic wand um, and you could, you know, talk and you could pull in every tech vendor or vendor in this industry and you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing about it. What's the thing today in our industry that just is the thing that either it's a challenge that hasn't been solved or it's something you're like, I just wish this could get fixed. Like it, this is just painful for all of us. Yeah. Uh, can I have more than one wish? No. You can have, you can uh, have I three. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like from a tech perspective, I think there's, there's a lot of, I want the systems to work better together, right? Like they, they, nothing talks to each other very well or, or seamlessly. And it creates that, and that creates more complexity in the way that we can measure and do all the things we want to do, make sure it's brand safe and all of the things. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of, I don't know if it's just competitive advantage that needs to happen, right? With the various vendors and tech partners out there, but I want them to work better together and they don't right now. And, and I'm hoping over time we can figure out a solve for that because I think if they work better together and talk to each other better, it'll allow for more working dollars to run into the system and it allow for like, again, it goes back to the goo. I use that word a lot and people laugh at me. I'm like, there's a lot of goo in the system and I want to clear <laughs> up the pipe so that we can just create more working media to reach our audiences, right? Because it, it's, it's a hugely fragmented marketplace. We're already talking about a very distracted audience in itself and we need to find better ways to resonate. And I feel like the technology and the pipes, they're just, they're real clogged. Time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, when you've got data sitting in a search platform or a social platform or another platform, it's just really difficult to really move fast and actually create the insights. Yeah. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think everybody is feeling the burden of that today. So let's move to Hilton. Um, and yeah. for, let me just say, wow, right? I mean, what a year. So uh, once again, for context, Rebecca, uh, you were with Cap One for a few years, and you joined Hilton, I think, in middle of 2019. So you were there okay. for six months. You had an opportunity to learn the lay of the land, get your feet wet, and then mm-hmm. the greatest crisis of our lifetime hits. And although it's been hard for everyone, okay, uh, I don't think anybody, you know, would argue that the travel and the tourism industry, specific, you know, airlines, hotels have been hit the hardest. So if you don't mind, I'd love for you just to share with us, you know, what was that? I mean, this, we're sitting a year, almost a year, you know, to the month away. What happened? Like what was going yeah. on? Ooh. Yeah, you know, as, as we've already established, I've been around for a while. And so we've seen a lot of different, you know, crises, um, right? But nothing obviously compared to this. And you know, I'm not going to lie. It's like, really, wow, I joined the travel industry during the biggest crisis <laughs> that's going to hit this industry ever. So you're right. It, it was exciting. I, I I love to travel. I love the idea of traveling. I, I love Hilton in general. Like, it's just one of the hotel brands that I've always been a, a loyal fan of. So this was like dream job for me to be able to come in and take my experience and build start to build something. And, you know, I'm still able to do that, which is great. But during that time, you know, I was, you know, I think as everyone was during this time, scared, right? Professionally and personally, like, I think it's this combo of of not really knowing what was going to happen to your industry and your job and how that was going to start looking in this new world and your life and your family. I mean, you're scared personally, like, am I going to die next week? I have no idea. Yes, exactly. The impact to your family. You know, I have a daughter who, you know, is a school age daughter and she, you know, what's happening there and managing through all of that. So, you know, I'm not alone in that. And and I know that like, this is everyone's story. Right. Um, And I think, um, for me, uh, you know, really in the early days, I, I kind of liken it to kind of there's a process that I kind of went through in terms of coping. And the, the first thing first is, you know, as um, a leader of teams, a leader of, you know, my personal life, but also saying, okay, you know what, it's crisis mode. Let's figure this out. 
and start to batten down the hatches. We need to really start to think about where our media investments placed today, what are our positions, what's flexible, what's not, how do we think about this and let's start to develop out the scenarios that are needed to, to bubble up to my executive leadership so that we can really quickly make decisions on what we need to do based on what we know today, right? Um, and obviously we're a global company. And so um, having a foothold in China, you know, there was some of those early opportunities to see that things were starting to move in this direction. I don't think any of us would have predicted where it went. We had a million different scenarios. Was it a K recovery, a W recovery, a, all of the different letters and none of them were right, right? right <laughs> and so, right, right. Um, so I think it was really just mobilizing the team and keeping morale as high as possible while, you know, going through this and basically, you know, finding ways to dismantle what, what we've built over the last several months um, uh, to ensure that, you know, we as a, as a company and as a brand, you know, we're, we're in solid footing to weather through the storm, right? Um, so that was really the early days there, I, I'll say, yeah. before we all went home. There was a lot of hand sanitizer, a lot of long nights, and a lot of whiteboarding of what, right. what all this would look like. Um, and then trying to do that at home, you know, a week later uh, was certainly a challenge. Yeah, I can remember, um, I think it was probably last May that I saw, I heard your CEO talk. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was interesting where he said, look, we've got, we're a global brand, we have locations in China. And he's like, so we actually were fairly well aware of this really early on. I do just want to mention one thing that through this all, um, as much as painful as it's been, as much as people have you know been hurt, I have to just say, and I talk about this a lot, that I don't know how parents do it, and I definitely have no clue how single parents <clears throat> do this. Have you know what they've gone through this past year? It's just it's crazy to to think about. And so I've always said to our team, look. You know, if you know of a single parent in our organization, you know, pick up, help them out, pick up some slack for them because they've just got to be upside down right now in their life and trying to manage everything. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just, so when you guys are sitting at the whiteboard, you have no idea what's going on the way I always say, it's like, I felt like I was, you know, trying to play darts and hit a dartboard in the dark blindfolded, trying to reset a budget in two weeks. I have no idea what the world's going to look like, you know, or if I was going to die and all those were possibilities at the time. <laughs> and so now, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, how good was the industry uh, insights on, on working with you guys, helping you cancel contracts? I mean, and then did you guys just go totally dark? Uh, just walk us through kind of the media planning aspect of this and, and how you approached yeah. it initially. And then I'd love if you could just, you know, I'm sure you have more insights than most of us mm -hmm. relative to finger on the trigger pulse on the economy reopening, you know, communities reopening. And, you know, are we going to return? And then I, I'll kind of, I want to follow up on that. But afterwards, a little bit more on just business versus leisure and business travel. And what do you expect uh, going forward? Yeah, so a lot in there. That last one, I might yeah. turn back on you as, yeah. a, as a business leader yourself and what you think. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, walking through, I think, as we've scenario planned, we've kind of established that. I think, you know, certainly the advertising the travel messages in a time global pandemic when travel was restricted was just not appropriate. And so we recognized that pretty early on and, and made all efforts to pause advertising um, or any travel specific messaging um, at the, especially at the height of the, of, of the pandemic in the beginning. Um, and, and I think from, and, and to do that, it required a lot of partnership and a lot of conversation with um, our media partners and, you know, helping, you know, just, I don't think, I don't think it was like a, this is why we need to do it. I think everyone understood that. I think it, it's really more about like, here's where we are. And I think it goes back to that, that collaboration and the partnership, mobilizing our agencies to support us and our media partners as well. Um, you know, but there, after we kind of established crisis and, and batten down the hatches, if you will, I think it was about, okay, how do you stay engaged, right, with your audiences um, to, to keep t Hilton top of mind? And I think there was, a, and, and also, how do we create, you know, that trust and, and provide um, a space at our properties, on our properties that are, are safe and, and people feel comfortable, you know, visiting? And so I think, you know, there's a number of things that 
we were able to do through launching our Queen State program with Lysol and how do you communicate that to working with our partners at American Express to donate a million rooms for frontline care workers. So I think we were able to mobilize some really critical programs to help um, you know, those in need of a place to stay, especially our front, the frontline workers, um, to quarantine away from their families when they are doing a critical service to our country and our society. Um, so doing that and then also starting to think about how do we create more value to our, our current customers and audiences by, you know, again, staying engaged. So maybe perfectly like what we ended up doing was saying, okay, you know, we sit on some pretty iconic recipes that have, were founded and created by many of our, our properties and brands. So we released, you know, our double tree cookie recipe, which had never been released before. Um, Waldorf salad, there's a lot of iconic uh, recipes and things that were created at our hotels that we were able to at least give that access to people. That's so I think great. really thinking about those kind of opportunities um, during this time to connect with our audiences so that our Hilton brand is still out there, but it's what we are not, we're not, we were not in a position at that point to communicate like travel again, you know, and I, then I think it was really around um, gleaning insights, tapping into our partners as well. Um, as you can see a trend, partnership is a critical critical learn, lesson learn around how important partnership with media uh, suppliers and our agencies were and are during this time because the, you know, we, we, yeah, we sit on insights ourselves and we have a great insights team who, who are constantly looking at what's happening with our, with the customers that we currently have in our honors, to, you know, membership base, but also just more widely spread and looking at social listening opportunities of what's happening in the market. But we are just one brand, one company, and there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other data out there that we want to tap into and we were able to get from our partners. So how do we one, leverage that to create an opportunity to communicate with our audiences more broadly? Yeah, the one thing that's interesting, right? First of all, being a global brand, you have a lot of access to data, right? That you guys sit on top of. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. are you, I'm just curious with, the vaccines rolling out, some countries are doing well, other countries aren't doing well. Are you, can you just talk maybe globally, like where you see the lights turning on again? And then even for the US, you know, what are you seeing? Are things starting to pick up? Um, you know, where are we at from Hilton's perspective? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I think from an industry perspective, you know, I think the the recent news of the EU opening their borders was a really big, you know, big win. I think vaccine distribution is, you know, creating optimism. So I'll say this, there is a lot of optimism, I think, in the system with a lot of these regulations lifting borders, opening up, um, people getting vaccinated um, to create more freedom of movement. And I also think because of this work from home scenario, you know, people aren't tethered to location like they used to be from a working perspective. And so I think seeing um, you know, we're just seeing even in our own, uh, our own corporate, you know, uh, team members where, you know, maybe we pick up and go for a week somewhere, you know, 600 miles down the road and, and put up shop there for a bit um, while we still work. And so I think we're, we're seeing a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I can't really speak too much to how we are personally doing, I think, you know, but we're seeing a lot of optimism for sure in, in the system and excited about the vaccine rollout continuing. Cause I think that's just a moment mm -hmm. of optimism that we all are, are looking forward to because it, it just creates more freedom for people to move about. And, you know, at the end of the day, people still want to travel, right? Like travel is pent up demand for travel revenge travel is actually a real thing, vaccinations, like all of the things that you hear in the headlines, you know, that's, that's absolutely true. So it's, it's a matter of how do we, um, when those, when the demand continues to, to rise and pick up, how do we ensure that Hilton is top of mind in the, in the planning process and, and they're choosing us first. And then, and then just in curious, uh, if we, I'm going to do maybe a lightning round, we've got just a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick hit really quick on uh, creative and messaging today in the media world uh, and yeah. how have you guys needed and when what's the what's the big message today I see a lot of the you know I see a lot of the memories commercials you know coming yeah. out just walk us through messaging today yeah 
Um, yeah, so the two new memories campaign, so we launched that in Q4 of last year and it's running again right now. Um, and I think really it's around the insight of, you know, when you're ready to travel, um, you know, Hilton has the experience for you in our 18 trading brands and, and we have, you know, an option for everyone. Um, and so I think it's really around not us saying travel, it's really mm -hmm. us saying when you're ready to travel, we're here um, and uh, we have an experience where you can create those new memories with yourself, your family, your loved ones, or or a moment of reconnection in some way to either you know that location you wanted to go to or being with the loved ones that you haven't maybe seen in a while. You know, it's funny. I say that I I love to say that to me life is all about the stories <clears throat> that we generate in our life. And if I think about the lack of stories, which was you know I meaning the lack of memories. Um, yeah. that we've had the last year. I think it's a great uh, messaging. All right, so last question for you, just um, let's end it on, you know, when crises hit, it's an opportunity to sit back, take stock, reflect, and innovate, change, or whatever. If there's something, if there's a silver lining in the last 12 to 15 months for you, or, and specifically Hilton, um, mm -hmm. how is this going to make Hilton better going forward? What are like two things that you guys are really yeah. saying? This has helped us see something that we weren't seeing before and we're going to do better at x y or z yeah i think i think it's it's uh for me i think it, it'll it's led us to this idea of, of agility that i don't think we've ever seen before you know about being more comfortable making decisions faster um because we have to and i think that's really something that you know i've personally seen um i think it's also opened up Amazingly, communication and teamwork across functional, across various functions where, you know, it, breaking down silos, even when we're in our own homes, I've found that our silos are breaking down because, you know, when you're mobilizing as a group under crisis, you, you kind of lose the noise of hierarchy and you lose the noise of this is my lane and your lane. And I think that's allowed us to, I think, be more innovative, be more agile and make decisions faster because we are able to um, break some of that down. And I think that's something that we um, as a company and, and especially a marketing team are, are continuing to, to evangelize um, together. Yeah. Okay, well, well, Christine, I have to, I have appreciate to the, it. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to say best of luck as you guys kind of go forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak. Thanks. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca and Sean. That was really inspiring as a Hilton Gold member. It was particularly inspiring um, to hear that my, my favorite hotel brand is, is, is well and good. So no, it's, it, and, and really, it's, it's, again, we could make a TV series out of these things. This is, you know, how, how does Hilton survive during the pandemic? I mean, that's a great, great story right there.